Yes, yes, yes. Shalom, Chavarim. Shalom. This is Yadon. Yadon. This is Ras Ayadonis Tafari. So right here, 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 here is um, Ab Abijit Ayer Mitra, Mitra, um, or Aim, as they call him here. He brilliantly explains Israel's ancient history in this clip here. Now we saw the fuller clip. There's a, another video where it's a fuller clip speaking about the um, Palestinian and state of um, Zionist state of Israel, or we can say, they like to say in the news, the Hamas, you know, which is a, they call it a terrorist organization versus the state of Israel, this, this nation state of Israel. Anyway, that's the whole history. He touches on that as well. Now there's a particular set of points he makes that I want to highlight first of all. He says about ethnicity, finding out who ethnicity is. He gives a basic, um, I call that basic history, basic referential history. You'll find a lot of references to what he speaks about. Much of it is historical. He does add his, I would say, his um, digestion, you know, like what he digests, what he interprets of certain things, you know, for his own flair and flavor. I found it to be very, very interesting. So when I saw this, that this was like a quick edit right here, you know, of the latter part of a, a fuller interview with, um, I think they're Hindus, because there's a, some mention of, you know, um, the connection of the Hindu struggle as Hindus, you know, within their particular region and uh, alliance or allegiance to the, the Jewish or Judaic Jewish history, you know, as like oppressed people, you know, within history and within certain narratives. But now once and once know how when we talk about the once lost, now found black and brown sheep or the people of the House of Israel and the Americas and the Caribbean, now that's our main focus. So in looking at this crisis, this present crisis or this present um, level of the crisis. Actually, it loops to the 70s. It's almost like a kind of a time, um, what do you call it again? Um, twilight zone. It's like really like in a twilight zone time right here. And if one's known the history back in the 70s, one can see a lot of interesting connections. Not to get into the prophecy of the the Christian Zionists and ism. We got to touch on that as well. The Hagees out there. And this very interesting dynamic that's at work right here, you know, and many perceive that there's something more going on with what's going on. You know, October 7th, it was the um, Simchat Torah, the Simchat Torah, the joy of the Torah. This is when, you know, the Hamas surprise attack that caught the... Um, State of Israel's intelligence services like Mossad, Mossad Shin Beit, and the IDF caught all of them by surprise. And this is like, what? This wall was totally penetrated from seven or more different areas. Nobody knew nothing. It seems to be, and they call it now, their own 9-11. So there's a whole angle with that. But getting beyond that to some of the points that he makes here, I would like to share this that's why I'm spending some time just talking about this particular video. You see the name of, I think it's on City, CT, CT, C-I-T-T-I. So here we have Abhijit Ayer Mitra explaining um, the history of Israel, but the ancient history of Israel. Now he's explaining from the lens, I call it the Eurocentric, you know, the Eurocentric, the European lens and the kind of latter day historical perspective of ancient Israel. Ancient Israel were definitely, we could say, when I say people of color, that's an open thing right there. They used to call black people colored people. But this is the context of what we know, the ancient Israelites. And we pray for our people over there as we did in the previous video. Um, you know, um, you see, we cry, you know, for the, you know, Afro-Palestinians and the Afro-Israelites. But now with that being said, let's touch on this map here. I thought this was interesting, though this is not really in the video video, but it does point out some interesting relationships when they talk about the two states. You might have heard people talk about the two state solution and there was this whole two state solution and how this goes back to even the 60s and even previous to that time. 
Now, there's a very interesting heel up to Big Judah, Big Judah, you know, and also heel up to Ra Seymour. I and I just vibes and brethren, you know, we usually do some just vibes and maybe we'll pick up a little bit more on this. Also, the Rasta Roundtable. It was a recent one that we was not able to be on, but just hail up to the brothers and priest Isaac as well, Kahen Yisak, you know, and the other brothers as well, Ras Isern, Ras Kwame, Ankoma Jed, and Ras Sefer Selassie as well. So check out the priest Isaac platform. Hopefully we might even address this particular subject matter concerning what's called the Palestine to Israel Palestine conflict. Now, to the points that Aim Abjit Aya Mitra right, makes is concerning defining ethnicity, right? Defining ethnicity. Now, when we talk about ancient ethnicity, here's one thing we have to realize we look around the world and there are certain peoples and groups in certain areas of the world who no doubt were in these areas of the world for thousands of years. Now, whether the people being, you know, assimilated for other peoples, you know, people meeting peoples and, you know, all of that, I'll leave that up to the geneticists <laughs> for right now. You know what I mean? That's a geneticist point. But I make that point because we have like the, the Ethiopians, for example, you know, or the Horn of Africa. You know, we have even southern, you know, southern portions of, of Egypt. And we say ancient Egypt, the Tawi, the Kemet, the people of the Aswan. We can look at the wall monuments and paintings. And that's a whole other hot button issue concerning, you know, the so-called ethnic. I'll say ethnic. People use the term race and race, of course, you know, according to modern science, political science, and other even pseudoscience is a artificial construct, even though it's a very important, right? And it's a leading artificial construct, even in, in this particular situation concerning, you know, the identity of who is Israel. Is Israel based on religion, right? Or being a, a Israeli or Israelite, is that based on ethnicity is it based on seed right the true answer of it is is both but in its origination in its true context is based on ethnicity and it is based on we could say on faith but there is a level of it of conversion i point that out because history proves that those who call themselves jews properly today the european jews that there is a conversion narrative that has even been researched by some of their own top, you know, scholars and 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 um, historical scientists to 740 A.D. So that makes a big question mark of ethnicity prior to that. But as we said, Abjit does focus on some important issues, and this is concerning the creation of this identity. Right, called Palestinian, and many will say, "Well, this the, they've been there for, for for a long time." Now, it would appear that they've been there in that region prior to, right, the modern day European Jews and the State of Israel, 1948, and those um, Ashkenazi, Khazarian, other, you know, ethnically we can say European, and even according to the biblical, um, Japhetic. Right, this isn't Japheth, Ashkenaz, and Gomer, Japheth people. This is what makes the whole Ukraine thing very interesting when we understand the real ethnicities of people. But speaking about the Palestinian, right? Um, not to regurgitate what he says in his particular video, you know, and his particular explanation, because we like to really take it from there and even take what he says in some bite-sized portions, because there's some portions where he lays out certain things and we could say that this is absolutely brilliant the way he explains his other areas where we put a, a question mark there. You know, basically he is presupposing the European Jews to be the Jews of the historical timeline. Now we know that because of this artificial construct of racism, other people might refer to as white supremacy or whitewashing, European whitewashing of, of history. 
this is something that needs to be considered. In the video, he speaks about the creation of Palestine. Let me bring it out of this for a moment. Where should we go to? You can see we have a few sets of exhibits, right? And not to get into a fully detailed right here, but let's first of all go to, he said that the Jews had, after 70 AD, they had returned after a couple of years. <laughs> Well, history doesn't really justify that. There was people who had returned, but it is most likely that these were like conversos or converts as there was proselytism that was going on. This is also a big part of the New Testament biblical narrative between those who were ethnically, you know, Israelites, like say Paul, for example, though he was a Jew, a Yehudi, he was of the tribe of Benjamin. Now we know that Yehuda, Judah is a tribe. So the next question is, well, how can you be of a Jew, a Yehudi, and of the tribe of Benjamin, which Benjamin is a different tribe. Now this gets into some interesting areas of Israel history and, 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 the, and the southern kingdom of Judah and the tribes that remained in the land when the 10 tribes were taken into the Assyrian, you could say Assyrian captivity, and for most general purposes of history become part of the lost, what they call the lost 10 tribes. You know, I like to make a little reference to, you know, um, there was a book that was written about the lost sheep in the Americas, the black peoples, the 10 little niggas, you know, just to point that out right there. I know it might, ones might say, well, what does that have to do with it? It has everything to do with it. Now, look at this map here. This is the kingdoms of David, Judah, and Ishbosheth, Israel, 2 Samuel 2 to 5. We was looking at a few of these maps, right? Now, there's some different maps, and you'll see smaller and larger areas. You see where it says Philistine, right? Philistine. You see where the Philistines is coastline. You see where it says Judah. Right. You see where it says Benjamin. Right. You see how Benjamin's right there. You see Ephraim. Right. Ephraim often is like a pseudonym, so to speak, in the scripture or another. It's a um, metaphoric name for the 10 tribes. And it's a metaphoric name for the northern kingdom. The Northern kingdom is Israel. The southern kingdom is Judah. We heard that some of the pro-Zionists back in the 40s and thereafter were questioning each other that they may have made a mistake. What's the mistake? The mistake in naming it the state of Israel, that they perhaps should have named it the state of Judah or Judea, since Judea is a very important historical reference that links with biblical and historical Israel, right? 740 AD, we cannot forget 740 AD, right? And we have this on good scholarship, even sort of European Jewish scholarship that points out that their introduction to Judaism and to the connection with the Israelites is through a religious and we could say political, philosophical, connection that occurred in 748. The Invention of the Jewish um, People is a very good book um, by um, Shlomo Sands. Right? We pointed out as a point of reference in case people say, well, how are you saying all this? This is not true. Well, look up Shlomo Sands and other books such as that. But that's the main book for the 748. So they said they made a mistake because when we look at maps, let's bring this up over here. Let's Go over here. Now, I was about to get into the Sea Peoples because um, Abhijit Ayer uh, Mitra, right, the one who we showed on the still right there, you know, they clipped out that part. So that particular video gives you the quick point of reference to, to the main part where he gives a brief history. He's asked to give a brief history. And when he asks the, 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 the woman... You know, the lady, you know, the Hindu lady acts like, um, I'm like, like what and where? And she says something about like the main, you know, the main point. And he says like, it's like hard to really just say the main point because everything is a significant point in this particular history. But one main point that he makes is this idea of Palestine, 
right, is not as ancient, historically testified. And when we then say, well, what's the root idea? He goes back to the Sea Peoples, right? The Sea Peoples, those who are called the Sea People and the Bronze Age Collapse. When I heard him say that, I said, wow. I said, a lot of people don't understand the significance of the Bronze Age Collapse as well as the significance of the biblical narrative that points to a sense of authenticity of the biblical narrative vis-a-vis real ancient historical happenings and things that were going on. It's like reading, say, newspapers and different testimonies of historical events, right? And then coming across, you know, other testimonies of these events and when you start to put them together, you say, well, even though this is written, some might say to glorify a certain people or to promote a certain um, um, perspective like the Bible. The Bible basically is a book of the Hebrews in one form, spiritually speaking, and of the Israelites, right? And in a modern sense, euphemistically speaking, of what one would call the Jewish people, right? But remember, Jew refers primarily to an abbreviated version of Judah or Yehuda, right? And originally that was a tribe and that tribal, we could say, that was like the last of the Israelites. You know, when you say Jedi, Judah, Judah, I, Jedi, they were the last of the Israelites representing, we could say, Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah and the whole connection with David and Messiah is very interesting. But if we go all the way back, this whole thing concerning what today is called Palestinian basically has its earliest points of reference in the Peleshet. Now, here we use um, Wallace Budge's uh, hieroglyphic dictionary, right? And you see the word there, per poor Sath. It says poor Sath. Now, not to get into all the linguistics of the hieroglyphic translations and ancient translations and how certain early linguists chose certain things. The R, the R, the letter R in ancient Egypt is thought by some of the main linguists to also double as an R, a R as an L sound. So the R and the L, I'll give a brief example. In some parts of the world, some people have what they call a rehotism, if I'm correct, rehotism. It's, uh, they call it like a, a kind of a speech impediment where they cannot pronounce or they do not pronounce certain sounds uh, like other speakers do. So for example, one might say, I love you, I love you, right? Those who have a sense of, I think it's called rehotism, right? Like rehotism, R-H-O, from that kind of ancient Greek kind of root, rootology. They will say, instead of saying, I love you, they'll say, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. So that pronunciation of the L sounds like a R and vice versa. I think there's another kind of speech impediment. Well, I say speech impediment or speech um, difficulty. Let's put it like that. And and this is kind of known if you you might have come across it. Some speakers will say instead of like I rove you, you know, um, you know, the, the R pronounces the L. And this is assumed to be the case with ancient Egyptian because certain words that use, uh, you know, the the mouth. I think it's the, is it the mouth glyph. Right, the mouth glyph, that one that looks like a mouth right there, you know what I mean? Is sometimes as an R, but it also doubles as an L. So here they have poor Sath, but actually that word there in by more modern um, linguists is Peleshet. Peleshet. Pursat Peleshet. Now it says the country of the Philistines. Now this is getting into more of the biblical narrative brings out now the Philistines in the biblical narrative are related to one of the sea peoples known as the Peleshet. 
And so what we're showing you right here is the glyph. And if we keep reading on, you see the symbols there. It says Thess 1204. It says the Palestinians. Then right next it says H-E-B, the Heb. Now the Heb right here, right, in the Asherit, later, not the earlier Paleo, but the later Asherit, in Ashur, Syria, remember history, Palishet, it says Palishtim. It says Palishtim. Palishtim in the Hebrew connected with the ancient Egyptian Peleshet. So we have Palishtim, right? Pelesht, Pelesht, uh, as a singular, adding the Yod Mim, the Im at the end, Palishtim. Now you see where it says next to A-S-S-Y-R, Assyria. Then you see below basically is the cuneiform, is the cuneiform of this same similar people, Peleshet, Palestine, and then biblically speaking, Philistine. So the earliest recorded document of this particular group of people that um, that Abhijit Aya Mitra correctly pointed out were considered to be invaders right invaders especially in ancient egypt so in ancient egypt they become one of these nine groups of people that were enemies to ancient egypt right and also lead to what many would call the bronze age collapse if you haven't studied anything about the bronze age collapse there's a few good videos out there if i remembered the Wichicoma i would um actually give you a point of reference but I think that you, you need to get the basic idea for yourself, the Bronze Age collapse, right? Which was roughly, some say around 1200 BCE, 1200. Now, properly speaking, the biblical Exodus, which um, Aim, Abhijit, Ayer, Mitra, he throws some shade on. He says it was basically all made up, so forth and so on. So we can understand what conventional view of history he's approaching it. But from some of the later history, linguistically speaking, as well as historical events, he's right and accurate. That basically this name, other than the Peleshet, the biblical Philistines or the Philistine, become closest connected. Basically, many, many scholars say it's the same people, right? Many say that it's the same people. So these sea invaders that came across what's known as the Great Green, the Mediterranean, right? So let's, 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 let's move on from here. This is an artist kind of, you know, rendition of what these people may have looked like. And it's kind of interesting because, okay, here we get a kind of a, a map. You can see this map. You can see where it says at the top sea people, the Thracians, the Dorians. These are some of the ancient groups of, um, 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 some would say Greek peoples, right? Others might point to Hellenistic people. Not all Greek people, ancient Greek people, but it's the Ionians. See, history and ethnicity and who's who. You know, it's like, it's like, America, right? You get European people who come from Europe, right? The so-called pilgrims of that particular narrative, they come to America, right? And they become Americans, but they are really British people. Aren't they British people? Aren't they European people? You know, or even English people or Protestant people. If we go, you see, we call them Protestant. We're looking at their religion. And that was a part of the narrative that they came over here and they even likened their own story, reading the Bible to the Israelites. See, I have to point it out because we have European people that go to different places in the world historically over the past 400 plus years, like Australia. And now they are Australian. How about the European and the Dutch people? The Deutsch people went to South Africa, right? And now they are Afrikaners. Are you following what I'm saying? You had the people already living in Australia. What about them? And let's not even talk about the Tasmanian people, where there are even groups of people, right, who history records them as being truly genocide, truly removed, you know, we could say almost from the human family, wiped out, right? Maybe some people survived by interbreeding or whatever, but for the majority, they were exterminated. I point that out because we have a history of certain people, even many African and Asian people, staying 
in the relatively approximate lands of their reputed ancestors. And we have other people kind of flying all around the world, right? Taking over places and then adopting the names of the peoples and the places that they take over. Now, this is the case of the Sea People. The Sea People is perhaps the earliest Palestinian connection if you, you look at the etymology. But he made a great point. He said that etymology is not history. Right? We're looking at ethnicity. We're looking at some really finer points right here. That, you know, and then we're also looking at religion and the incorporating of religion. And sometime where a religion, right, is doubling, right, where a religion, not, not the religion, but where the people who practice it, on one hand, they say they're ethnicity, but then connected to the people they're identifying with, they're not even of the biblical line. In other words, Ashkenaz is of, 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 of Japheth. Ashkenaz... Why uh, isn't Ashkenaz of Japheth? He, he's he's not of, mm, he's not of Shem, right? According to the scripture, right? And when we are identifying, let's say Jew today, we're looking at the political, the modern political dimensions. See, the modern political dimensions often get confused with the different narratives of ancient history. Right? As we study these things, as we can see that Aim Abhijitaya Mitra has studied it, and he presents certain prima facie, some basic facts. And now what we're showing right here is this movement of people. You see where it's My, um, Mycenaean Greece, right? We see where some say that this, this invasion of the sea peoples in Egypt, history is very important because Egypt history tells us that these people first get placed even in Palestine or what's called or what's called today Palestine or the, or the Phileshet. They're placed there by Ramses and others who had gained victory over this sea people. The sea people was like the ancient immigration thing. You know how they talk about immigration now? People are immigrating to Europe and Europe is all like, you know, concerned and taught. They're being genocide, all these people that they used to, remember, before they invaded these other people's countries, other people now, the, the later generation coming to the places that their people were invaded by the same European country. Same thing for America, like in, in the South America and the, the, the migrants and the immigrants. So this immigration thing is a very interesting thing. And this is what happened with the Sea Peoples, right? The Egyptians identify at least nine, right? At least nine, we can say um, nine... Um, peoples who are part of this almost like a coalition right now much is not known so much from the sea people's perspectives but much is known from their encounters with other historical people like the ancient Tawi or the ancient Egyptian people especially around the time of 1200 BC now right after this invasion of sea peoples we have the Bronze Age collapse you see all these areas on the map where there's these fires going on? These are ancient civilizations, right, which contiguous or around the same time all seem to have fallen within this Mediterranean great green area. Now you see down here with ancient Egypt, they give the date and time like 1208 BC and 1175 BC. You see places like Sias and Tanis and Memphis. You see also in 1178 BC. Then you see Ashkelon. Ashkelon, that's one of the places over within the Levant, which is a general name used by the Europeans after World War II. Did you know that there was no Middle East until World War II? And the, the term Middle East was created, so to speak, or first used by World War II reporters, right? So this part of the world that had other um, 
with Fertile Crescent and other, you know, what it was now called the Middle East because it, it, that's a very strange thing. So the Middle East, so where's the Middle West? Is there Middle North? Is there Middle South? No, or there's just the Middle East. This is the whole political terminology. Now, I point out World War II, right? And after World War II, we know about the Holocaust, World War II, the State of Israel, those establishments, but also that there was some... Um, uh, effort and thought to establish a Jewish state in Africa. I forget the sister's name that did the video, but she touched on that. A couple of sisters, you know, black women had touched on that as well. One, I think, African woman from Kenya had touched on that. Sorry, sis, didn't get your name, but it was a very important, you know, just to remind people. We've talked about that, but a lot of what's going on now is getting people to look into, you know, a little more history for themselves. Now, you see, there were cities that were destroyed. Those are the ones that have the flames. And there were cities which survived. Notice that it's only Egypt that really survived. Well, not only Egypt, but we also have uh, parts of Assyria. Sardis survives. Troy did not survive. Ancient Tarsus did not survive. Ugarit, you know, you can see all the places that Aleppo, Kadesh, Byblos did not survive. Tel Hazor did not survive. Ashkelon did not survive. Look, Babylon survived. Sipar didn't survive. Nippur. Now, a lot of this is interesting because this is where even ancient India connection with Elam comes into the picture. You know, when we start to look at, well, who's who? What's the modern connection? What's the ancient connections? Carter Kamesh didn't survive and so forth and so on. Now, the beginning of economic recovery. Mm -hmm. This almost sounds like something modern, right? We talk about economic recovery today, like Gaza and, and what's going on over there. What kind of economic recovery can they look forward to, right? But, you know, people are already discussing some of these things, you know, those people who do those things. But this map is interesting, too, because it points around 950-ish to like 880 B.C. Now, we're counting down B.C. So the Bronze Age collapse happened roughly around the time of the last millennia, the last thousand years, say roughly before the birth of Christ, as some historians used to point to it, or before what they call the, um, what they call well, some people don't like the A.D. because it's a religious and there is a Roman connection to it. The A.D. Anno Domini with the Roman Catholic Church. Now, keep the Roman in mind when we talk about the creation of Palestine. Right. Keep the British and the Americans in mind and also know that British and American culture, mother and daughter, also worship and idolize the Roman ideal. We can say that the Roman Empire really it, it fell, but it never really disappeared. Others continued to carry the ban of the Roman Empire. And what's interesting with this old thought about Palestine, the Roman Empire and Rome, just Red Rome, Esau. You know, remember Esau, Red Rome? Judaically, they refer to Rome as Esau, but that's a whole related matter, ain't it? That this whole connection has a lot to do with the Roman Empire in the modern Palestinian sense. And Abhijit, he did well to explain that with the Syria Palestina, that when the Romans named after, after Judea was, you could say, conquered after 70 AD, they renamed the area, right? They renamed the area Syria Palestina or Peleshet, Peleshet, Palestine. And that now in the Hebrew and even in a sense in the ancient Egyptian, the Peleshet Sea peoples before that is connected with the idea of invader or immigrant. So if you look up Peleshet, like Palestinian, you have this dual connection. Let me do this right here. Not going to be long on this, brothers and sisters, you know, but this is important. We was musing on this, especially with the recent, you know, the recent situation you know, going on. And we said that this really needs to be brought out, like, let's see, as like historically speaking, right? So you see what right here, Genesis 10 and 14. And Pat Rusin, 
and Ka Kasluhim, out of whom, you see there's a, there's a parenthetical, open parentheses, out of whom came Philistine or Philistine, right? Close parenthesis and Kaftorim. Now, what are we talking about here? We're talking about the Peleshti. Peleshti. Now, Peleshti is like to say an individual. It's like saying Yisraeli. Yisraeli is to say an individual Israelite. Yisraelim, Israelites. Yisraeli. So here we have Peleshti, right? Peleshti. BDB defines it, the Browns Drivers Briggs definition as immigrants, right? Abhijit Ayer Mitra, he brings out the uh, alternative sense of that, which is also true as invader. You know how they look at immigrants as invaders? You know what I mean? Now, why do people usually immigrate? Because there's economic and other crisis in their whatever lands they are in, and they see opportunity and survival in another land. All right? Just to make that connection to sea peoples, right? and the most ancient origins of what people often refer to as Palestinian. The inhabitant of Philistia, descendants of Mitzrayim. Uh oh, wait, hold on for a moment. Descendants of who? Mizraim. Now, this is what the Brown Drivers of Briggs are saying. Who immigrated from Kaftor? Now, here in parentheses, they put Crete. Remember Crete? Crete is across the Great Green or the Mediterranean, the Middle Earth, Mediterranean. Crete is a place over in what they would call the Greece area or the Ionian, Javan area, Yonawian area to the western sea coast of Canaan. Now, what's interesting, and I'm not too sure when Brown Drivers Briggs, you know, a lot of this, like even Strong's Concordance and Genesius, Genesius, these are references that I use. Many of them are very correct in many things, especially for those those times in which the researchers research. But then a lot of new things have been discovered, archaeology and corroboration that gives us a, a clearer picture. See, the clearer picture is that the Peleshet were one of the sea peoples, right? And the main sea peoples who had engaged with Ramses, right? Roughly around 12 to like 1100 um, BC, right? And they were seeking to invade the greener part, like of the Delta, the more fertile part. Now, what was going on back in their uh, homelands? We can see the Bronze Age collapse. There was, some people say, natural disaster upheaval. Some people say there were volcanoes. Some people talk about Pompeii. Other things were occurring that was driving populations out. And they must have known that the fertile place where they can get grain and food and they can survive was the Delta in Egypt. And they came in mass. And there's some very interesting wall paintings and testimonials of Ramses of the back and forth. Eventually, he cut a deal with them. Eventually, he used some of them as his own mercenaries. He basically did, Ramses did what um, one of the Roman emperors did with the the Germanic tribes. You might have heard about Rome and the Germanic tribes. Basically, the Germanic tribes are coming from like the region they call Germany. And they were some of the most hostile and fierce of the Roman, you know, opposition that they had encountered. Eventually, some of the Roman emperors thought and the Senate thought, say, you know what? Let's have them work for us. Let them make, be the Praetorian, the Praetorian Guard. The Praetorian Guard is like the um, secret service, you know, that basically guards, you know, the president, you know, and the key people of government. This is what they did with the Germanic tribes. And some historians think that was able to make the Germanic tribes less of a threat because basically what they recognize is they want to be Roman too. And you want to be Roman. You want to be American. You want to be Roman. You want to be American. You know what I mean? You want to be British. And think about the politics of that today, right? When these people come forward and they say they offer them a way to citizenship, there ain't nothing new under the sun, right? So the more clearer picture is that after Ramses was able to defeat them, right, and even incorporated some of them as his mercenaries, you know what I mean? Um, he re, how can you say, 
located them. Ramses relocated them to Egypt, to, to, to the Canaan, to the land of Canaan, Canaan, right? The Canaanu Anu, to Canaan, aka to what people call Palestine. Or we're gonna go back to the biblical term because then we can see how the different groups of people, the different ethnicities historically come into view. He basically put them there to guard that land because before that, in the time of the the remember Ramses, like the new kingdom, in the time of the middle kingdom, and even before Egypt had, you could say, control or regulation of that land. There were Egyptian troops that were there. So Ramses was able to bring back his Egyptian troops and put the Peleshet, a.k.a. Philistine, the Philistines there to guard the land, to like guard the coast, basically to do the job. It's almost like replacing troops, using the other people as the troops, and then you pull back your troops. Almost like the UN. It looks like something like that. It was Ramsey's own mini version of the UN. So he placed them there. Now, after that time, Egypt became weaker. As Egypt became weaker because of political and international situations Egypt was dealing with, as the Tawi, the two lands became weaker. They broke off. In other words, the Palestine, right? The Palestine, they broke off and they became the Pentapolis. Now, the Pentapolis, what is the Pentapolis? The Penta, Penta is like five, right? And Opolis is, you know, like five cities, police, Penta, police, polis. Police is not the police, police, but it's the city. The city is the police. So they get the police. Right. To police the police. They get the police, you know, a group of ones that they call the police and their job is to guard the city. Right. Because cities are very economical institutions. It's like a big marketplace. It's, you know, it's a place of strong economics. And, you know, that does a lot, you know, because we can get if we can order the foods that we that, that we used to eating. You know, most of us would not stay in these places we stay in. So just think about that for a moment. So anyway, the part about what Ramses was able to do, like remember, this is still the sea people's time and putting the Palestine, the palate, not the pal they were not the Palestinians, but etymologically, this is where the connection come from. So the first ones to move in this people that have the strongest, we could say linguistic, economic, um, I'm going to say etymology, though etymology is not history. But what's interesting is that if one were to research it, if you go research these things, and we've kind of done these things already and probably should have probably done it again just for the sake of ones and ones getting as clear a view, right? A clear a view of this as possible. Let's just do this right here. Let's go um, Philistine, right? Philistine. Right at Philistine and etymology. Now, I know etymology is not, but there's some very important things that we can learn. From. Philistine. What? Philistine. Now, Philistine today, I don't know if you know, Philistine today is often like a reference to a confrontation between university students and townspeople in Jena, Germany in the late 17th century. A sermon on the conflict quoted, the Philistines are upon you from Judges chapter 16. And this led to an association between the townspeople and those who are hostile to culture. So usually somebody who is uncultured, they usually call them a Philistine. So you might hear today they say somebody who is uncultured is called a Philistine. Now, the English term Philistine comes from old French, Philistine, classic Latin, Philistinus, from late Greek, Philistinoi, ultimately from Hebrew, Palesti, or Palesti, right? Palesti, plural, Palestine, meaning people of Peleshet. And then now, to get a background on that historically, we go to the ancient Egyptians, the Sea Peoples, in the time of Ramses. And there are cognates in the Akkadian Palastu and the Egyptian Palusata. Some say it's Palusata, Palushata, so forth and so on. Now, a quick etymology here, as we touched on this right here. You know, the Hebrew, Palestine, people of Peleshet. So from the Hebrew, 
Shemite and the Israelite and the Bible, biblical Hebrew to the Egyptian, we have that connection. So we can say that the Pelestim, the Peleshet of ancient Egypt are connected with the Philistines of the Hebrew narrative. And then we get the backstory that it was Ramses who had positioned them there to replace the Egyptian troops that used to be there during the previous, um, you say, dynasties and, and kingdoms, the Middle Kingdom, because Ramses is like around the time of the New Kingdom, right? So um, they say the word is probably a name, a people's name for themselves, and this is correct, right? But it gets the sense later on in history of a heathen enemy or a, a an unfeeling foe, right? And then we have a person that's deficient in liberal culture. I want you to keep that in mind. A, a person who's deficient in liberal culture, polister, an enemy of God's word, the Germans later on in their religious uh, strapulations for it out. Like, so somebody who was a Philistine was like an enemy of God's word. Now, we have to understand how important this is in English and what's going on today. Literally, Philistine, inhabitants of a biblical land, neighbors and enemies of Israel. I want you to keep that in mind when it says neighbors. So in the sort of two-state solution, remember I was talking about that briefly, right? Popularized, we talk about the uncultured person aspect of that. Then we have Palestine here, right? Palestine, Palestine here. Now, let me look at the time here. We'll pick up on a part two of this. Right, try to keep this within the hour, uh, an hour or so. So, these peoples. Uh, let me see if do I have anything here to kind of show you some of these people. I right? like to show you some of these people right here. This is how the Egyptians had described some of these people. Isn't it interesting? When you see the nine bowls you begin to see that there were dark-skinned people that seemed to be like Nubian or Nihilitic, uh, some would say Africans or the Tarnesi, right? right? Or some would say the Kush, right? Also referred to be the, the Kashtu, Kashta, Kashtu people. This is some of those enemies of ancient Egypt, right? And their connections with the Sea Peoples, right? You see some of them... You know, they're, they're different in their complexion. Now, notice they call the black one, this is that racism, artificial contract. They say that he's a Negro. Then they say one is the Syrian. Then one is just the Asiatic, whatever that means, right? Then the next one is Hittite, right? And next one is Libyan. These are all peoples that the ancient Egyptians viewed as enemies, part of the nine bowls, and were conspirators, or the sea peoples are conspiring with them, like the people of Cush, the one that they called the Negro, right? Or like the Hittite here, right? Or how about the Amorite? You see what it says, the Philistine? They call this one the Philistine right here. You see this one right, right here? Philistine, right? The Philistine here. Now, you can see what's interesting about the headgear. Because elsewhere where you look at the sea people, the Pelisha, that same headgear is there. So you can see this is part of what, you know, the Egyptian view of these particular people who were very much connected with the events of the fall of the Bronze Age and the rise of the Iron, the Iron Age, right? Um, which has a lot to do when we talk about technology today. So we see the events that happen, you know, technology. One group of people will have a technology that makes them kind of superior, but other groups of people will begin to pick up on the, you know, you know, the technology, as it were. All right, so that right there, not to be labor this right here, because um, there's more and we didn't even get into the main parts of the particular maps. But I think suffice it to say right here, let's go right here. So the Simchat Torah, right? This is supposed to be a, a Pelesti, right? A, a Philistine. These are supposed to be the Philistines from ancient Egypt, their wall painting, right? So this becomes one of the main historical points of reference, right? That when we cross, compare, and contrast linguistically and otherwise, we see that they're speaking of the same people that the Israelites call the Philistines. 
And what's interesting is the later connection, right, with the Palestinians or what the name. And but this is connected with Rome. Rome, right? Rome picks up in a sense where Egypt in a sense left off. In other words, if the the Egyptians didn't place the Philistines on the coast to guard the coast, guess what? Against sea peoples invaders. In other words, to replace them at what they were doing previous to, right? And then we get, well, well, let's go on to this right here, you know, and then you can see that they were not just, the sea peoples were not just one peoples. It seems like they were a group of peoples. This is also one of the sea peoples. You know, they had some cultural differences, right? But they all seem to have worked together, right? In the, uh, you could say, invasions, especially the Egypt, Egypt took the brunt of it. But amazingly, get this right here, amazingly, Egypt survives the Bronze Age collapse, as we showed you in the earlier map, right? So remember these Peleshti, they went into these different areas. See right here, the green part is Egypt. That's where Ramses contended. Now you see the next arrow. The next arrow points to where Ramses and other um, Kemetic or Egyptian Tawi rulers would place the, the Philistines or the Peleshtim there, the Peleshet, and then the Peleshet worked for the Egyptians until Egypt got weaker and they broke off and they established their five city-states, the Pentopolis. And now the Bible kind of picks up on that particular narrative, you know, that particular narrative right there. Invade Egypt, Greece, Palestine, Syria, Libya, Turkey. Okay, this is some memes out there. There's a map I want to show you before we seal this up right here. There's a map. There's a few maps right here, right? Okay, let's look at this map. Notice this right here. You see where it says, it's kind of the... You see what says Arab tribes down there, the kingdom of Edom, right? The Nabao, Nabatu, right? Tribes, the kingdom of Moab. You see what it says the kingdom of Judah, right? Now you see over the coast, that part where it says Philistine states, Ashdod, Ashkelon, and you see what it says Gaza, right? Now that's the part of the map that we see all this that's going on right there. But all of this even during the time of the biblical Israelites were inhabited by the Palestine who originally were placed there by ancient Egypt. This is what's interesting by ancient Egypt. This is the map that he uses right here in that particular video. And then you see the Northern kingdom is the kingdom of Israel. So we have the Southern kingdom, Judah and the Northern kingdom. And this is one of the reasons why some of the early European Zionists were questioning whether they made a mistake in calling it the state of Israel instead of the state of Judea. All right, Judea. I don't know if anybody has come across that. We'll bring some evidence to bear on this. So ancient Palestine, Phoenicia, and Syria. All right. Now, some say the empire of David and Solomon. All right. 1,000. It's said to be 1,000 to 925. It's outlined in the red, right? Outlined in the red. Now you see where they put Palestine there. Then you see Israel there, Jerusalem there. But this is a false nomenclature where you see Palestine there, right? At the particular period of time of David. Why? Because it's not testified to. What is testified at that particular time to anything of a similar name is the Peleshet. And that's where you see the Philistines in Ashkelon, and then you see Gaza right there. The same particular region that we see today, which is in and connected the neighbors to them, the neighbors of the Palestine, the ancient, quote, real connection to the Palestinians, were the Judahites. And in the northern portion was Israel. The name Palestinian, let's get right to this right here so we can seal this up. Palestine. Here we go. Palestine. Right? Palestine from the Latin Palestina, the name of a Roman province. So Egypt, ancient Egypt begins this 
kind of repositioning, repopulation kind of a thing. It's almost like when the Australians, the Aboriginal Australians, saw all these Europeans come over there in boats. Or the African people, black peoples of South Africa, the Bantu, if you call them, Twi, Twa, right? When they saw all these Boer and Europeans come in, this is the same thing we see in the time of the ancient Egyptians. And then who is the one now who picks up on it? How does it come down to us from the Latins and the Romans? This is why I said that the Romans have a lot to do with it. And then their latter day descendants, the British, right? And their descendants, the Americans. That's why they're so involved in this politics. And when you go back to even the state of Israel, you see both of them involved through a sort of a proxy, the United Nations, the other nations. Because remember, even under Rome, was many nations was under Rome. So Palestina, a Roman province. And this Roman province, when was this Roman province created? Right? This Roman province was created after the fall of Jerusalem and after 70 AD. Before that, we don't see the name testify. And in modern times, the idea of Palestine and we get this testified roughly around the 1920s, right? Historically speaking. Before that, it was under the Ottoman Turks. Abijit, Ayer, Mitra broke that down very well, right? And before the Ottoman Turks, right, it was what the Romans had set up. And then after that, with the British, the British, because they idolized the Roman way and are kind of the ears of that. So many Roman buildings, statues, culture, all of that. You know, Greco-Roman culture, Republic, democracy, Greek is in there too. And the Greek, Palestine, that's, they say Herodotus, right? From Hebrew, Peleshet. You see from the Hebrew, Peleshet, Philistia, land of the Philistines. And we already went to that. Now in Josephus, the country of the Philistines extended under Roman rule to all Judea and later to Samaria and Galilee. Notice that in Josephus, the country of the Philistines, right? They extended that because we showed you where it was on the ancient maps, right? And recorded even by the Egyptians. Where did they put those Philistines? Right in that proximate area of Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ashdod to guard the coast against other sea peoples. Revived as an official political territorial name. Even when they say revived, the reason why the Romans did that, right, was basically almost like a middle finger up to the to the Jews after 70 AD, right? Basically, to take away all hope, because he recognized his people having that nation, that nation, even Judea, you know, was very important. So what they did was just rename the place Syria, Syria, Palestina, Syria of the invaders. And in Josephus time is also where we get that, that extension of from this area. It's like saying, it's like taking um, New York and expanding the name New York so that New York is not just up in the northern part of the eastern sea coast, but all the way down the coast is New York, or taking Atlanta and making Florida Atlanta and then extending the name all the way over here. And since if they're the rulers and, you know, they're ruling by might, so forth and so on, and that power and domination, who's there to contradict? And if they rule for a long enough period of time, it becomes part of the historical record. So this idea about reviving this is when it first becomes actually an official political territorial name because he asked a good question. He said, who were the rulers? Go back to ancient, you know, Palestinian rulers. You will not find that. You might be able to find Philistine rulers. So this was under, with the British mandate. Once again, the British who idolized the Romans and even felt themselves to be the inheritors 
of the ancient Roman mantle. Under Turkish rule, the Ottoman Turks, Palestine was part of three administrative regions. In other words, what you call and people call Palestine today was under three different regions. The Valiette of Beirut, so it wasn't called Palestine, it's called the Valiette of Beirut. The independent Sanjak, independent, they call it the Sanjak, right, of Jerusalem, Sanjak, Jerusalem and the Vilayet of Damascus. So basically what they had is Beirut, Jerusalem, and Damascus in the area that later on, right, with the British mandate, with them, basically, because they know their history, right? Or they know the Roman history. They're going back to what the Romans did, and they named it that, right? So the Turks didn't name it that, right? The Romans named it that, and the British renamed it that. Right? So this is like a very recent thing. In 1917, the country was conquered by British forces. So this is when it all happened. Before that, the Turks had called the area that many people today probably call Palestine, Beirut, Vilayat of Beirut, Sanjak of Jerusalem, and the Vilayat of Damascus. So Beirut, which is like Lebanon area, Jerusalem, and Damascus. Damascus. But now in 1917, the country was conquered by British forces who held it under occupation until the mandate was established April 25th, 1920. So this is where the whole thing really, really begins politically. Here's what the political, um, what they call it again, the political... Um, storm. Right, shite storm begins by the Supreme Council of the Allied Powers at where San Remo, Romo, Ramo, Romo, San Remo. During the occupation, Palestine formed occupied enemy territory south, right? Administration south. That's what they called it. And the headquarters was at Jerusalem. So the British, of course understanding Roman history went back to if it was good enough for the Romans, it was good enough for them. So basically the British revived, all right? So, th so their hands are kind of dirty on both sides. Some people say it's like, you know, you know, two thieves fighting over stolen property. Some people say this, you know, and when you start to look at these things, you begin to question, right? And you begin to have some his history, right? From which to question like this map right here look at this map right here this map right here right notice on this map the, the blue is judah the green is the green is um israel right let's go right there the kingdom of judah the kingdom of israel then notice where the philistines are that coastline two-state solution this is why i say why didn't they just deal with the two-state solution because even in the time of the great kings the Davidic kings, right? When we look at the historical documentation, there were both of these places there. And the Phoenicians, notice where the Phoenicians are. Notice where the Phoenicians, people don't even talk about the Phoenicians, do they? In this context, right? Let's look at this map right here. Now, this map right here is during the time of the Ottoman Turks, what we just talked about. Vialat of Aleppo, Vialat of Beirut, Vialat of Syria and the autonomous Sanjak, right? The Sanjak. So notice the names. They this is right before they would rename it Palestine. Notice that. Now, of course, one could say, well, the Romans did that, but the Romans did that because they destroyed Judea and the last remnant of a Yehudi state, you know, from them times because of the, you know, the rebellion or whatnot like that. So this is important history because this is the history prior to, but you know, they don't really show these sort of maps because then people will be it's like this politics shite, right? You see where they said the Gaza Strip, right? Now, this is more bringing it to some modern maps, right? If you think about it, as some thought about it, the two states would have been, I know some might not like us to say this, but a better solution. Now, this is a, very interesting map here, right? I'm going to get into the providence of this. This map here, 900 BCs. Here is saying Israel, right? With Judah there, Israel there, 
above is a place called Zoba, as we have testified in the scriptures. Zoba or Tsoba, right? Tsoba, that Syria, Tsoba. But notice at the top where we had on the other map a connection with the Phoenician, Palestine. Notice where this is located on the map. And then now notice down here we have Philistia. So this map both has Philistia, Peleshet, and then it has Palestine, right? Now, this is before the time of the Romans, roughly 900 BC, right? But on each of these maps, you can see that area over there, Philistios. You see Philistios? You see Judah there in the south. You see Israel in the north. But you do see that there's other regions that is occupied by other people in the times of the ancient Israelite United Kingdom, you know, Israel in the north and Judah in the south, right? In the time of Solomon and David. And we even see where Edom and Moab were. Notice where Edom and Moab, Rabat ben Ammon, the children of Ammon. So you see other territories, Aram of Damascus, Aram Zobah. This is also testified. See where up there, Beirut, Sidon, these coast places, right? That is not directly under Israelite rule, right? And then you see Egypt over there, right? So these are just different maps that kind of show, you know, how we get, you know, to where we got, you know what I mean? How we get to where we got. Now, all right, so let's, let's, let's seal up on this. There's more, but we don't want to get into other areas of the study but um, once again, it's a very, very interesting historical view. And the more we go over the history, the kind of the clearer and the simplicity of what really went on. And we really can see all the games. There's a lot of games that are used to obfuscate. You know what I mean? What's recorded as the realest history that's really recorded. Here we have another, you know, this is the Sheridan, another group of of the sea peoples, how they moved around. But definitely the sea people connection, Egypt connection as well. Egypt, first connection, Rome, the next connection, and thirdly, Britain and America, right? Britain and America picking up and continuing the Syria Palestina, right? The Syria Palestina. And although etymology is not history, Etymology is also a very important tool, right, towards, you know, either confirming, affirming a connection, right, and this Philistine, Peleshet, right, both in the Hebrew Bible and on the wall painting of ancient Egypt is the root idea of this. And then the Romans, right, what the Romans would do post-70 A.D., and then how the British would revive it. The Ottoman Turks didn't revive that name. You note that? They were Muslim. They were not Arabs, but they were Islamic and were seeking to set up the caliphate. And it's the Ottoman Turks that actually shape this modern so-called Arab world prior to the British mandate. But Aim, Abhijit, Aya, Mitra, Right. And the Hindu sister, thanks very much for this. I hope one should check this out and come, 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 you know, let us reason. Shalom, Chavarin. Shalom.